I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual now. Qili. Nian Shao Tuo Tang. San Jia Shen Ji Gong. Yi Ji Gong. Zai Ji Gong. San Ji Gong. San Jia Go Wei Tu Chuan Shi Ji Gong. Kai Ban Yi Ji Gong. Qing Zuo Xia. Thanks, Derek. Good morning to you. And once again, let me welcome all of you to another gorgeous Sunday and a wonderful day to be alive. It's a, actually a relatively sunny and dry Sunday, despite the weather forecast here in scenic Indianapolis. It was supposed to be raining. I'm thankful it's not. I might even actually get my backyard cut before it gets, you know, five feet tall again. But that's a whole other topic. As always, whatever it's doing outside, it's a always a wonderful day to get together and share the process and the and the lessons that we're all learning and the things that we're going through as we cultivate the Tao teachings. Today's talk came from a, a question from my oldest daughter who asked me what karma was. <laughs> That's a, a, a really, really very deep and involved question and I only have about half an hour so we're going to have to give this uh, a once over. Uh, at a rather cursory level, but perhaps um, a bit of discussion about it will engender other questions and perhaps a desire to dig more deeply into it. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, if anything that I that I say here or uh, uh, publish is uh, more than an opinion turns out to be inaccurate, uh, any of you can feel free to straighten me out there. I don't have a huge stake in uh, in being right all the time. Although I try to study hard so I'm right most of the time. <laughs> anyway, you know, the question my daughter asked me was, what, what is karma? What is it? How does it work? At its simplest, karma is the universal law of cause and effect. That, that's what it is. It goes back as far as some of the uh, earliest Hindu teachings in Sanskrit, uh, which of course was in, in India, and has followed its way through those traditions into Buddhism and, and into the Tao traditions. Karma is essentially uh, the equal and opposite reaction for our actions. It is uh, the complement to what we do and why we do it. And very often in connection with, with karma itself, be it positive or negative, uh, you'll hear me and other folks uh, refer to yet another ancient, ancient, ancient term, which is samsara, the uh, ever-turning wheel. Right? You'll hear me say very often that uh, sometimes we're at the top of the wheel and sometimes we're at the bottom, but most of the time we're either on one side going up or the other side coming down. Uh, it is that wheel of uh, eternity that is the, the machinery, if you will, behind karma. I hear a lot of people say that, that karma entails a, a certain amount of predestination or, or fate or destiny, things along those lines, that because of the nature of our, our karma and our human condition, that we somehow are preordained to go down a certain path, to, to uh, encounter certain lessons, to uh, uh, be of a particular disposition or not. Um, I, I hope to dispel that to a, a large degree. Um, there's not uh, a great deal of, of predestination or preordination in, in any of the philosophical Tao teachings. Um, we are the product of, of what we believe, what we do, what we think why we do what we do, and none of those things is necessarily fated to be. Although in some cases there's a fairly predictable predisposition towards certain things. The other thing that I get asked a lot from, uh, uh, from, from well, many people actually, is, uh, is karma something that, that we encounter after we die? Is that the... Uh, the universal sum uh, uh, comeuppance for what we've done 
for how we've lived for what we thought and how we acted? Is it something that that gets us now or something that gets us later? And uh, uh, well, we'll go into that in a bit more detail. The easy answer at the moment is it's both. Uh, there is some karma that is almost immediate based on our actions and, and some that span lifetimes. Uh, depending on one's particular belief about reincarnation, uh, one may choose to remove the S from lifetimes. Uh, I myself being a rather staunch proponent of, of reincarnation, it makes a great deal of sense to me. Uh, my understanding is that in in fact there are things that we can do in this lifetime that will reach out across multiple lifetimes for multiple people. The one other thing that isn't written down here, it's actually in the summary, is that there isn't any one of us who can ever untangle the web of karma. We can't do that for ourselves, let alone do it for anyone else. It's, it's too big, it's too intricate, there are too many other people involved, too many other connections, it's not something that we can actually see the whole picture of in, in this mundane existence. It just isn't possible. So if uh, somebody tries to tell you that they understand your karma, uh, they probably don't. That's, in my mind anyway, not a realistic statement to make. So let's kind of kind of talk our way through this a bit. I actually chose a verse from the New Testament <laughs> to describe the universal law of cause and effect. <clears throat> and what it says is that as a man sows, that also shall he reap. Uh, I didn't look up the, 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 the chapter and verse. I believe it can be found in the letter to the Philippians. But even if it's not quite there, the text is correct. What it amounts to is is that the, the, the intentions behind our actions and our actions themselves create a, a path of completion. There is why we do what we do, the motivation. There is the action itself. There is the outcome of the actions. And then there are the potential consequences, whether positive or negative. Uh, that go along with having committed the action. For instance, if I go rob a bank, one of the natural outcomes of that is that very likely in a fairly short amount of time I'm going to wind up in jail. The reason why I robbed the bank at that point is irrelevant. Whether it was because my family was starving and I felt like I needed the money and was somehow in that case justified, or whether I was just doing it because I wanted a couple of extra bucks, in the end isn't going to make any difference. The fact is, is that by robbing a bank, we've broken the laws of the society in which we live, and that karma is going to settle upon us immediately. The, the consequences for that action are, are swift and relatively severe. Therefore, wise advice is don't go rob a bank. Right? Not, not too hard to figure out. Some other things that we do, some other things that we believe, the motivations behind some of our other actions are not nearly so clear. There are uh, beliefs and thoughts and words and actions that, that come forth from us based on our past, based on our core values and beliefs that were largely locked into us by the time we were about six years old, perhaps by our religious upbringing or our spiritual path, whatever that may be, and by circumstances that are exigent at the time that, that the event takes place, where we feel we may be reacting to a, a particular situation that needed a particular course of action. And, and perhaps there the motivation wasn't even considered. When those things happen, and they happen all the time, very often we don't have all of the information that we need to make a completely informed decision or to understand what the full impact of our actions is going to be. 
but that's something that we should uh, strive at, at every opportunity to acquire. The more we know going in, the better decisions we make while we're there. There are some things where we actually choose whether or not we're going to pursue a particular path. Am I going to argue about this topic or that with my wife? There are some things about which, you know, she and I have some, some fairly strong beliefs. Uh, some of them we don't always agree on. Some of them we've argued about. Not a lot, but now and again. And, and every time we get ready to have one of those heated discussions, on both sides of that discussion is a choice. It's a choice about the need to be right, the need to, to overcome, to win the argument. You know, well, <laughs> I've been around long enough now and uh, you know, suffered enough lessons in karma to know that it's uh, actually better for me if I just let her win. <laughs> That doesn't mean I can't state my beliefs. It just means I don't have to argue about them. I don't have to be compelled to be right. And that gets us into the topic of the intent versus the action. Why we do what we do is almost as important as what we do. The motivation behind the action. I believe that motivation plays a, a large part in the effects of karma in our lives. I believe there are times where people do the wrong things for the right reasons because the motive is pure and perhaps through either ignorance or or some other uh, misunderstanding you know what an individual does perhaps isn't the the best choice that could have been made but it was the best choice the person knew of at the time. In short, the person was doing the best that he or she knew how in that moment. And, and heaven knows, haven't we all been there? I have three kids at home. Not a single one of them came to me with an owner's manual or a user's guide. I have absolutely no idea sometimes whether or not I'm doing the right thing as regards raising my children. But the one thing that I always know is that my heart is always in the right place. My motivation for interacting with them is the love of a father for his children. And my intent is their highest and best good, to raise them to be upstanding, decent, respectable people on this planet and to have a spiritual path of their own that leads them into more positive karma than negative. Do I always get it right? No, absolutely not, I don't. We never do. But because I cultivate the Tao teachings, because I am aware of the action of karma, because I temper my thoughts and my actions with the small grains of wisdom that I've acquired over the years, there seems to be some kind of mitigating force in karma that causes even my mistakes to come out right. That makes the outcome the desired goal. That my children learn what they needed to know and do what they should have done. Even if I didn't quite do it right. Even if I didn't quite explain it right. And every time I see that happen, and, and little synergies like that happen to me all the time, I, it never ceases to amaze me that that's the case. Because looking at those events in hindsight, I can't do anything but wonder how and why that worked out. <laughs> and, and yet it does, time and time again. Very often it is the question of why we do what we do that guides the hand of karma. But, but don't be mistaken. Karma brings with it its entire list of life lessons. And if we fail to learn the lessons that are presented to us in a relatively reasonable number of lifetimes, usually less than that, then we're begging to have problems. It is much easier from the perspective of karmic action to learn the life lessons when they're small and easy because if we don't do it then, they keep coming back.
And each time they come back, they're a little bigger and a little harder. Until finally, one day the universal wrecking ball of enlightenment comes through your life. And you're left sitting in a little pile of the stones that once were what you thought was a perfect and well-ordered life. Left to pick the pieces up and figure out why in the devil it went so badly wrong. I've lived with that particular karma for years now. I lost a son because of that very karmic action, because I did not do the things I should have done. And that's a hard lesson to swallow. That lesson transformed my life. But what a price to pay to change. Learn your lessons while they're small. Okay? By learning those lessons, we grow spiritually, we grow mentally. We grow beyond the bounds of our current understanding into a much more metaphysical wisdom, if you will, where we may not quite know how or why karma works, but we know that it does. And we know when to let that process work and leave it alone. That spiritual growth is born only of experience. And those experiences we need to pay attention to. <clears throat> as long as we're acting with the right motivation and trying to do the right things, ultimately we will accrue positive karma. Okay. And reverse the negative. A little word on samsara, the wheel of eternity. Because the, this comes up now and, now and again, and not infrequently, you ought to at least have a, some kind of an imagining as to exactly what that is. Samsara is the eternally turning wheel. It is uh, the path of our lives through the universe at a very simplistic, illustrative level. And where we are on that wheel kind of indicates whether we're in a period of good fortune, misfortune, if we've hit bottom or if we're at the top. The trick is when we're at the bottom to not let the wheel run over us. Right? Derek spoke last week of, of good fortune not necessarily always being so great and misfortune not always being so bad. It is that knowledge, that wisdom that causes the sage and and hopefully us Tao cultivators, to temper our thoughts about good fortune and misfortune with a bit of wisdom, with a, uh, the ability to be content with, with where we are in life, with where we are on the wheel at any given moment, so that we're not always striving for uh, what our neighbor has or the stuff that we can't afford or the stuff we need to get rid of. <laughs> That wheel turns eternally. It doesn't ever stop. And most of the time, we're either on the top coming down or the bottom going up. We spend precious little time at the top or at the bottom. So for those periods of time where we're at the top of the world and everything's just wonderful and it just possibly couldn't ever get better, understand that a period of some kind of misfortune is going to ensue at some point. It is the cyclical nature of living this life. And concomitantly, when we're at the bottom of the, of the wheel and we feel like we have a, three school buses sitting on top of us and there's just absolutely no hope, there's a period of good fortune following that. Change is the only constant in the Tao. And everything changes. For every yin, there is yang, and every yang, yin. That's the truth. 
everything is ultimately returning. That is the very nature of the Tao itself, and that's what Lao Tzu says word for word. That returning is the nature of the Tao. We all are trying to find our way back home. Karma is one of the mechanisms that helps us to do that. We refer very often to Tao cultivation and the study of these ancient teachings as the path or the way. The Tao, right? But in truth, there are many facets of the Tao, if you will, kind of like uh, a soccer ball or a diamond, where it's a uh, where it's a, a multifaceted in nature, where you can turn it over in your hands and, and see many, many sides. And karma, as well as the cultivation of the teachings, as well as the nature of returning and change, all contribute to where we are on that path at any given moment in time. What happens to us is that as we're walking down that path, we are presented from time to time with choices based on what we're doing, where we're working, where we live, what our family situation is, and tons of other circumstances that are all part of just being born into this existence. And at every one of those points in the path where we have to make a choice or a decision, we have the free will at that moment to affect both the path and our karma. We have the ability to alter at any time where we're going and what we're doing. So in terms of predestination and preordinate, pre, yeah, let me try that in English, preordination or fate or destiny, those things truly do not exist. We have things within us that are predispositions, things that we are either genetically predisposed to do or that uh, we have acquired by our, our childhood upbringing, our lessons in school, our lives when we were younger and more impressionable, our lives now. There are all kinds of circumstances that affect uh, how we think and how we view the world and how we view our spirituality and everything else. But none of them has anything to do with a predestination or the supposition that we are in some way uh, hopeless and, and uh, uh, indefensible victims of fate or destiny. We're not. We have the ability to change. We have the ability to change our path and our karma. So to answer the question as to how karma works, is it unalterable? Is it immutable? No. We all have accrued our fair share of negative karma. I would suppose there are very few people uh, who've ever been born on this earth who didn't accrue a certain amount of, of negative karma in their lives. But we were not predestined to that outcome. We're not predestined to any one outcome. Okay. The fact that karma is not inalterable takes away that, that myth of, of fate and preordination. But it raises the value of learning by orders of magnitude. As we learn, as we grow spiritually, emotionally, and mentally, we can change the direction our life is going to any place we want. It's never too late in the life of a human being to change the direction of the path. And in point of fact, for those who are uh, both involved in this study group and at the periphery of it, attaining Tao, practicing the Tao teachings, okay? the things that we hear every Sunday and hopefully every day of our lives thereafter are the very keys themselves to accruing that positive karma. 
to reversing negative karma, to, to erasing that from our lives and, and replacing that with positive karma accrued by a life of service and right and appropriate giving. I'm not necessarily the best person to talk about that transformation of karma. I'm going to suggest uh, to all of you who have uh, one of the ordained masters available, if you have questions there, to ask them, and perhaps Derek would like to add a bit to that after I get done. But what I do know is, is that it can be done. To a certain degree, I've done it. And so it's not impossible. And the fact that it isn't impossible for me says that anyone can do it. I know my past. Okay? It's one of the many things to be thankful and grateful for as we venerate the, the principles and the virtues of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and those who've gone on before us. So down to the most immediate question. <laughs> And my daughter will be will be happy to hear this. I think, is it is it now or is it later? I said earlier that it's both, and it is. There are actions that we uh, get involved in in our lives, where the consequences for those actions are short term, fairly immediate, and not horribly overly catastrophic or horribly overly beneficial. Either one, the routine minutia of our days. Uh, the decisions that we make that, that don't have a big impact on either ourselves or anyone else uh, as long as we're not injuring another person in some way probably don't register much on the on the needle of karma okay those things are just a, a matter of living and unless we're either a mother Teresa or a Satan himself the, the routine of our day-to-day -day lives is not a huge deal, not in terms of karma. There are, however, things that we can do that will span lifetimes of karma. Consider saying or doing something that causes another person to fall from the path. Something that causes one who was just beginning to cultivate the Tao teachings to close his mind and walk away. What's the price tag in karma for that? I have to believe it's severe. Because in that one single action, we've altered the life path of another human being to the point where it may be catastrophic. We don't have any way to know. Conversely, what happens if we help someone else to find the path? if we manage to illuminate the path well enough by our words and our examples to help another people find another person find their way there I can't help but think that that doing that that inspiring another person to find the Tao probably has a, an equally large uh, karmic bang if you will because of the positive impact that action has on another human beings life most of the time, karma is more or less, as John Lennon liked to call it, instant. The consequences of our actions, our thoughts, our words, normally land on us pretty quickly. Don't be mistaken. The fact that the lesson or the karma hasn't landed on your desk uh, imminently doesn't mean that it's not coming. It simply means it hasn't gotten there yet. But in this life, the vast majority of our actions are recompensed fairly immediately. We can see the outcome of what we do. And, and thankfully, if we're watching that, we can also adjust our, our position on the path, if you will, the way that we think, the things that we do, so that next time around, perhaps maybe we make a better decision than we made the last time. Or perhaps you know we did something really beneficial and so we remember to do that again. It's almost like a, a respondent conditioning from the school of behaviorism, right? You, you push one pedal, you get an electric shock. You push another one, you get a candy cane. Pretty soon everybody learns to go find the candy canes. <laughs> 
Reinforce the positive, remove the negative. We've talked already about the life consequences in karma. But once again, that's absolutely key to our future existences. I cannot imagine, once again, the, the price that would befall me if I caused somebody to, to stray from the path. But then again, I also can't even begin to fathom the positive karma from helping someone find it. In short, there are things that we can do that have such a profound effect on other people that the consequences of that behavior can span lifetimes. The scary thing is sometimes we may not know that. It may not be within our purview. We may not have the ability. So it's important to keep the heart in the right place and continue along that positive Tao path for ourselves. By doing that, we learn to accrue positive karma. We learn to do the things that are beneficial to others and therefore karmically beneficial to ourselves. And eventually, if we manage to do it well enough, <coughs> pardon, perhaps then we can begin to transform the negative karma into positive karma. We can erase some of the past, some of the ignorance, some of the mistakes, and replace that with a, a much more positive karma. Never ignore the lessons of karma. Never. Positive or negative, either one. Those things should always teach us, either by teaching us what to do or by teaching us what not to do. But to take those lessons lightly or to ignore them altogether is to invite a lesson that we're not going to want, and it isn't going to be fun. If, if you take anything away from this talk at all today, remember that, that single point. The experience is a harsh teacher. It is a brutal teacher, but it is a wonderful teacher. And so when something, something less than positive, when something catastrophic or unfortunate occurs to us, don't get mired in the emotions of self-pity and self-doubt and worthlessness and all of those things, but rather find the lesson, the kernel of truth in the misfortune and learn from it and take that with you out of the misfortune and into the good fortune. Three minutes over. I'm doing better than I did last week. Let's wrap it up just a bit. I guess as I as I thought about this at the end, you know, where I tried to summarize uh, the contents of this talk, even this little 30-minute overview of a uh, of karma is, uh, well, it's pretty doggone deep in a lot of ways. So so what do you say to to, to take away from this? Uh, something that's going to be beneficial. Well, okay, how's about starting with karma as it work in, in everything that we think, that we do, and that we say. Our karma becomes a, the mirror of our mental state and, and the reflection of our inner person. As we truly are on the inside, we will be karmically. Our actions, our thoughts, our words will be reflected in that karma. Therefore, the closer we get to cultivating the true teachings, the closer we get, hopefully one day, to becoming a sage at this, perhaps, the closer we get to being the person we ought to be and not the person we are now, the better that reflection becomes. The, the second thing, and this is my opinion only, you can accept it or reject it as you see fit, I think that the actions of karma very largely are based on the intent and the actions of the person who commits the, the act, whatever it is, good or bad. I think the why has as much to do with karma as the what. And I think, although I can't attribute it to a divine intelligence or a intelligent design of some form, that there is a universal mechanism out there that in some way understands the intent as well as the action. I've seen too many really unusual synergies occur not to believe that. 
Thirdly, and I believe this is really important for us to remember, it's not possible for us to unravel the web of karma. Not even for a single life, not from this earthbound perspective, not even for ourselves. We can't do it. it it's too big. It's too much. It's, it's too complex. It touches too many other lives. And so trying to do that, I believe, is a futile venture. But I think attempting to influence our, our accrual of karma is probably the most worthwhile activity we can engage in. And lastly, I think, and in fact, I know this to be true. Once again, I've done it. In attaining the Tao and living the virtues, we absolutely can transform what was previously negative karma in our lives into that which is positive. As our hearts and minds change, so also changes our karma. That reflection in the mirror becomes more what we should be and less what we were. Thank you all awful much for letting me share with you today. And I, I hope, like I always do, that something I said was useful or helpful to somebody. Have a Let's go ahead and do the meeting and the ritual, everybody. Shiri. Mian Xiang Huo Tang. Sijia San Jigong. Yi Jigong. Zai Jigong. San Jigong. Sijia Gu Gu Xi Jigong. Jie Ban Yi Jigong. OK, everybody, we are done. Participate in the Dao meeting by joining us online. For information, go to Taoism.net forward slash Tao.